live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Hi, everyone. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. My name is Chris, your host for the Science Cafe here in the Daily Planet Cafe. If you got some good food or a good drink tonight, give it up for the staff of the Daily Planet Cafe. Thank you very much. Wanted to make sure a shout out to them for hosting us every Thursday night, all the events we do here at the museum, and even more cool stuff that they help us out with all the time, so kudos to them. But yeah, welcome to the Science Cafe, our weekly event where we find out what's going on in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, turn that around and bring it into the museum and figure out what's going on in our daily lives and how those two things come together. Where can we find science going on in the world that impacts us on a daily basis at least? And tonight's topic on e-cigarettes is quite timely, I think. I heard that there was a news story about this on one of the major networks uh, just, I think, just yesterday. And today I was doing a little research, reading up, and trying to learn just a little bit about this so I could be prepared tonight. And one of the things that I noticed right off the bat, I went to Almighty Google and I typed in the word cigarettes. And all of the search hits for that one word were government websites telling you how bad they are for you. The health effects of smoking cigarettes. Uh, cessation websites, right? Here's how you can quit smoking. And smoking's effect on adults and teens and kids. And that was every hit for the first page. But then I went and typed in e-cigarettes, wanted to see what popped up with that one search term. And the first page were advertisements, or the websites for consumers, or for companies, right, that were selling e-cigarettes and selling devices. So I'm really curious to learn more about what's going on in this world of e-cigarettes that just on the front page of Google, you get really very different sorts of things going on. And I'm curious to find out what that means for their health effects, if I'm gleaning something, right? Something about it being companies and then government health websites just stands out to me. So tonight we actually have Alona Jaspers. She is a PhD professor in pediatrics, microbiology, immunology, environmental sciences, and engineering. She knows everything about everything and is striving to learn what she doesn't know yet through the process of science. Put your hands together and welcome to the stage Dr. Alona Jaspers. Perfect, all right, let's see. Uh, can everybody hear me? Excellent, I have a loud voice. Actually, uh, in prior sort of seminars, people have taken the microphone away from me. So um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is going to be a lively audience. Uh, please ask questions in between. Um, if you can't get up to a microphone, I'll try to repeat the questions so everyone can hear them. But please, let's make this interactive. I want to get your feedback. And I may throw out one or two questions to you. So um, as introduced, I, um, I wear many hats. And I also direct the toxicology program at UNC. Um, who here knows what is toxicology? Who knows a toxicologist? So we have a few. We have a few toxicologists, OK? We, you know a toxicologist. All right. So we have a few people who know a toxicologist or know what toxicology is. A lot of people do not know. So let me tell you what it is not. So I have been, I got my PhD in toxicology. I go to the annual meeting of the Society of Toxicology. As a matter of fact, I'm going on Sunday. I can guarantee you nobody looks like that in the Society of Toxicology. You're a toxicologist, you can attest to that, correct? Yeah, nobody looks like that. 
<laughs> so, so Toxicologist is not CSI Miami or any of those kind of popular shows. What toxicology is, it's actually the science of sort of regulating and looking at pharmaceutical toxicity, environmental toxic, uh, toxicology, sort of watershed toxicity, toxicity and things like that. Consumer home products. Uh, you know, we all are using products every day. They need to be safe. Toxicologists are there to make sure that they are safe. Air pollution, which is a big field of interest to me, in addition to e-cigarettes, I do a lot of research on ambient air pollution, such as ozone. And of course, the topic for tonight is cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So in the science of toxicology, what we do is there's, a many, there's basically a wide variety of what toxicologists do. It's really the science of toxic substances with respect to many different aspects. The sources. Where does the toxicant come from? And if so, can we potentially regulate it? Properties. Is it a liquid? Is it a solid? Is it a gas? Is it something that leaches out? What is the source and what are the properties? Metabolism and biotransformation, and I'll get to, into that a little bit later because it becomes really important in the context of e-cigarettes, and I'll tell you why in a couple of slides. Mechanisms of toxicity. How does you know, a toxicant cause a particular adverse outcome? So mechanisms. And of course, the toxic affects biological outcomes and then detection and measurement of biomarkers. Clinical manifestations, so forensic toxicology, medical examiner, those are really more of the clinical manifestations, but also just public health and clinical outcomes of an exposure to a toxicant is what toxicologists like myself do. So management risk assessment is what regulatory agencies such as the EPA do or CDC. So people like myself basically provide the science to actually then understand and regulate and set policy to make sure we live in a safe environment. So what I want to do tonight is in the, using the example of e-cigarettes, tell you what toxicologists do and sort of go through some of these sort of points of what toxicologists do using e-cigarettes as an example. But I'm sort of a little bit of a history buff, and I think a lot of things need to be put into a historical context. Um, North Carolina is a great state to understand the history of tobacco products. We're right in the middle of it. So I want to give you a little bit of the sort of historical background of tobacco products, which I personally find absolutely fascinating. So there was obviously, um, it sort of came with, uh, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus. It was used, uh, sort of, it was actually through Native Americans, basically was brought back to Europe. And that's how actually the European got it. And then in 17, I can't read it, 1780, Pierre Lorillard actually started the first, what we would consider the first tobacco manufacturing company. Um, shortly thereafter, we have, um, People like um, the Revolutionary War was actually financed with uh, tobacco products. And then uh, in the 1800s, we then had Philip Morris, who actually started the career on Marlborough Street in London. That's where Marlborough comes from. Shortly thereafter, right here in Durham, North Carolina, we, uh, the Duke family actually sort of um, started what we now know as the common cigarette. That's what their patent was. The son of uh, the first Duke was actually the president of American Tobacco, uh, which then made Lucky Strike. Anyone who's ever been to Durham sees the water tower with Lucky Strike. So there's a real big history in sort of tobacco products right here in the Research Triangle Park area. In uh, 1875, we started R.J. Reynolds, not far uh, down the road from uh, Durham, for where Lucky Strike is. Uh, 1902, Philip Morris actually came to the United States. So they're originally European, but then came to the United States. Um, and then R.J. Reynolds made what we now know Camel. So it's sort of, you know, you sort of see the historical progression of uh, cigarette products, the major cigarette makers, tobacco product uh, makers. Then we go into World War I. World War I really is where tobacco products sort of exploded. Uh, a lot of, um, you know, um, actually soldiers were given cigarettes as sort of like a way to calm them down and to keep them happy. 
So the World War I was really sort of like a key factor in terms of rising the use of tobacco products and cigarettes. Shortly thereafter, World War II, um, tobacco products were part of the sea rations of soldiers, um, and actually Lucky Strike was part of those sea rations. A little fun fact here, I was born and raised in Germany. Um, my parents came to visit me here in North Carolina not too long ago for the first time. And we took them, I took my parents who were bo both born in 41, grew up in you know, post-war Germany, and I took them to downtown Durham, and they saw Lucky Strike. And my mom basically said, oh my gosh, I have not seen that in many, many years. She actually spent her childhood in the American occupied zone. And for her, Lucky Strike meant a currency. Lucky Strike was in the sea rations and was used as a currency to actually pay for goods. So for her, that was actually something very different than probably for us. Moving forward, after World War II in 2009, President Obama signed into law the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. That law gave FDA jurisdiction over tobacco products. At that time, it was really more for tobacco products, for cigarettes, cigars, usually, you know, what we would consider tobacco products at the time. E-cigarettes really weren't here yet, and I'll show you the timeline for e-cigarettes, why the timing was somewhat bad. In 2016, however, the FDA, in May of 2016, the FDA uh, passed the FDA deeming rule. What that means is basically it also gave FDA jurisdiction of all products deemed tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, including hookah, including snuff, including many different products. So that was 2016, May of 2016. It became effective in August 2016 with some of the regulations and was sort of be sort of phased in over a couple of years with certain things supposed to be happening in 2018. Well, we had a change of guards in Washington. So some of those things have been kicked down the road a little bit, and I'll get to that in a, se in a second. So the history of e-cigarettes here, it was actually electronic nicotine delivery devices, or ENDS, were first patented by Gilbert in 1965 here in the US. Nobody really took advantage of that patent because at that time, cigarettes were doing really, really well in the US. There was no need for an electronic nicotine delivery device. So the patent never actually became effective. Fast forward, 2003. A pharmacist uh, by the name of Han Lick from Beijing developed what we now know as the common e-cigarette. Han Lick's father was a smoker and died of lung cancer. And he wanted to develop a device that delivered nicotine without all of the other bad combustion products that are known to cause cancer. So he is what we would consider the father of the modern e-cigarette. It was really first introduced, and there's not really a, a real definitive timeline here, but we think e-cigarettes really came to the U.S. around probably closer to 2007. So you understand why the Family, tobacco, Family Smoking and Prevent Tobacco Prevention Act in 2009 was really bad timing because e-cigarettes had literally just arrived in the U.S. and we really didn't know about it. So now, it's supposed to be regulated by the FDA, and certain things are, certain things are not. They're supposed to be regulated by 2022. And we have no, uh, no idea, really, what the long-term effects are of vaping or inhaling e-cig aerosols. And that's really what is sort of of concern to me as a toxicologist. So the first products that are coming, that were came, came to the U.S., or were produced in the U.S., are these sort of e you know, cig likes Blue is a big company, and then you have many different devices, and I'll give you lots of examples of these e-cigarettes. Another question. Who has seen someone else vape? All right. All right. Excellent. So you all know what these devices potentially look like, what it looks like if somebody vapes. Great. So, of course, it also has hit major media. Hollywood is all out. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio keeps his favorite e-liquid juice on his nightstand and sort of tweets or blogs or whatever he does about it. 
Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of uses something there, which I have no idea exactly what that is. Um, but so it's definitely in the mainstream media in Hollywood as well. Now, ASIC uh, background a little bit more. This is actually a typical picture of what you would see in an e-liquid or e-cigarette or vape shop. There's plenty of them around. We have, I think, about five alone on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. So it's a big market. Um, it's, the sales in 2014 were 1.7 billion. Uh, they're expected to be way higher in 2015 and 2020 and beyond. If you think about, so one of the slides that I usually um, sort of set up here is so the projected e-cig uh, um, sale is supposed to be about 10 billion in 2017, 2018. I was lucky enough to visit the country of Malta last year, which is a small country in the South Mediterranean. The entire GDP of Malta is 11 billion. So think about it. The sales of e-cigarettes in the U.S. are supposed to be making about 10 billion. The entire GDP of a small European country is 11 billion. That's how much money we're talking about here. So as of January in 2014, and these slides are really outdated because the field is moving so fast, but there's no new data available. In 2014, we had over 400 e-liquid brands, meaning if you were to go online and look for e-liquid or e-cigarette uh, vendors, you would have the choice of over 400 different brands. Some of them are no longer available, but others have now arrived on the market, and I'll show you some in a second. There's also, at that point, were over 7,000 different flavors. Okay, so flavors can range from anything to, you know, from anything like strawberry, strawberry cupcake, to battle frog, and a walk in the mall whatever that means, okay? So it can basically vary and be as descript or as nondescript as much as you want. Yes, go ahead. So the question was whether in, in all of our research, whether we are also taking into account the cannabinoid oils that are now coming out and being vaped. Excellent question. Um, we did not. Because some of these are not legal and because some of these may have consequences for if we tell people or we document that they have these in their biological samples, we actually do not do that. That's an excellent question because that market is exploding as well. That in, in North Carolina, right. So there was the incidents also on um, the military base where they're suspecting there was overdosing of that. Mm -hmm. So again, the FDA deeming rule uh, was put into effect in May of uh, 2016, really got, uh, became effective in August. Um, and now applications are really not due until 2022, which originally was supposed to be 2018. So. A lot of these have now been delayed. Uh, flavorings are not, flavoring agents are not regulated yet. So that's not part of the regulation at all. And I'll just leave it at that. All right, so progression of eSIG devices. I showed you, the, um, you know, some of the devices already in a previous slide. And it's really interesting how we developed from the device that was originally developed by Han Lick in Beijing to where we are today. And think about the time frame we're talking about here. Han Lick developed this in 2003. It came to the United States in 2007. It's now March of 2018. The time frame is really not that, not that um, big. So here we are. We have the first devices, which look like cigarettes. They're called cigalikes. Um, and then the second generation are these vape pens. These vape pens have a tank, uh, which you, you can refill with the e-liquid of your choice. And from there, we actually now have the third and fourth generation devices, which have much more powerful uh, batteries, uh, very different sort of wicking and coils and all of the sort of ways to aerosolize your uh, e-liquid. So if you see people having these big plumes that you see coming out of their mouth when they're vaping, they're most likely using a third or fourth generation device. You do not get those with the Sigalikes. 
And of course, the market is because it's completely uncontrolled. It's the Wild West. It's completely, you know, anything goes. So you have devices like this little minion, which when you vape sort of rolls its eyes. You have little kitty. Uh, figure out what the demographic it is here that this is targeting. Uh, you have your Atari uh, sort of remote control that functions also as an e-cigarette. I heard that there is also an iPhone case that functions as an e-cigarette. And then you have this one here, which has a double tank. Any idea why you need double tanks? Why, you, why would you need two tanks? No, you don't. The coil is the same for both of them. Why would you need two tanks? No, so one tank is actually designed. One tank is designed for the e-liquids. The other tank is de designed for more agricultural products. So you can vape your pot as well and then have your Oreo cookies in the form of an e-liquid. So the new kid on the block, all right, so who has heard of Juul? This is usually a complete generational divide. So um, every single, ask your local high schooler, ask your kids, your nieces, nephews, your neighbors, whoever you can reach as a high schooler, every high schooler knows about Juul. I guarantee you that. Even the nerdiest kids know about Juul. I was able to give Teen Science Cafe a few weeks ago. These ladies always sort of, you know, read me into sort of all kinds of different um, community outreach things. And I was able to give Teen Science Cafe in the Moorhead Planetarium in Chapel Hill. This is attended by, um, you know, great kids, really smart kids, wonderful, energetic, all science kids. So they're, they're a bit nerdy like I am. You know, I felt like they're, they're like my peeps, all right? So they're like me, like I was when I was a teenager. Every single one of them knew more about Juul than I did. And I study this. It's unbelievable. Juul is really is like taking the market. It is the iPhone of vaporizers. It has a super slick de design. It looks like a flash drive. It comes in basically your, um, it has a USB port where you can charge it on your laptop. Um, you even have like clothing that I found now. I actually did uh, sort of revise some of my slides and found you can actually buy a sweatshirt uh, with jewel stuff on it. it. Within a year, it got over $220 million in sale. Uh, over 30% market share. Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds are scared of jewel. They hate it because it's taking the e-cigarette market, you know, by surprise. It was actually a project, a dissertation project, by graduate students at Stanford. Thank you, Stanford. Um, and so it's actually from a chemistry perspective, from a toxicologist perspective, it's actually really, really interesting because it does not, it uses a different form of nicotine. It uses nicotine salts uh, with benzoic acid. And there's some really, really interesting chemistry and interesting physical chemistry, chemical characteristic that come with that. So, Again, I'm totally geeking out on this. So I'm really fascinated by, by Juul for that uh, reason. But, yes, go ahead. So, so the question was, um, teenagers get habituated to Juul extremely quickly. Yes. So I, I took that slide up, but to answer your question. So the benzoic acid nicotine allows Juul to actually use a lot higher nicotine levels in their e-liquid. So usually in your normal e-liquids that you buy in your local vape shop, you get anything from a zero to 3.6 mil mil uh, milligrams per milliliter nicotine content. Juul is five. And the way they're doing it, also stabilizing it. So Juul is as effective or even more effective as a cigarette to deliver nicotine. And it does it in a very sleek way. The other thing is there was an NPR um, uh, sort of uh, broadcast on this as well and entitled uh, saying it's discreet enough to vape in class. 
Um, I recently talked to Durham County um, public school teachers and one of the math teacher was in my lecture there and she said, yes, I confiscated one of them in class. I have a 14-year-old freshman and a 16-year-old sophomore at Chapel Hill High School. They both tell me kids do it in class because it's discreet enough, you can do it in class. So it's everywhere in the local high schools, which I had no idea actually happened. And I study this. So getting back, uh, looking at the sort of example here of an e-liquid walk in the mall, I think it's called, uh, what actually is in it? There's actually, you know, there's some stable things that are in most of them and then some unique ones that are very different in like seven or 8,000 different varieties. You have your propylene glycol and your vegetable glycerin. Those are your base compound. Uh, they're humectants, so they basically are there to uh, provide a solvent for the nicotine and for the flavoring compounds, to provide um, the plume and the aerosolization, as well as a potential throat hit, which is what smokers prefer, um, as well as a viscous enough material so it actually becomes an aerosol and not a, just a pure vapor. So these are the two base compounds that are in the vast majority of all e-liquids. They come in different ratios, depending on whether you want more of a plume or more of a throat hit. That's all sort of, you know, sort of uh, user preferred, but they're in all of the devices. Flavorings, and I'll get into that in a second. Nicotine, you can actually have nicotine-free e-cigarettes. Totally available. You can have zero milligram per milliliter nicotine e-liquids. We bought some of those, ran them through the mass spec, guess what shows up? The nicotine. So just because it says zero milligram per milliliter on there doesn't mean that's what it is. The QA or the quality assurance or quality control of these e-liquids is kind of scary. I think I could probably do a better job in my lab making a lot of these flavors. And then there's a sort of other odd contaminants that you may be able to find in your e-liquids. So people have actually found Cialis in e-liquids. That's an interesting side effect. But the ones that are really um, sort of concern me for a number of reasons are flavorings. And I hope I'll convince you why that is of in interest and concern to me. So the toxicity of cigarettes is very well known. We know, we all know it's bad for you. Um, we know that there is products coming out of, or that are being inhaled as, as in a combination with cigarette smoke that are causing cancer. Those are the nitrosamines, as well as some of the metals and things like that. So we know, we, you know, cigarette smoke, we study it really, really well. So we juxtapose that to what we do know about e-cigarettes. And there's some unique characteristics of e-cigarettes that I think we need to consider. Again, the propylene glycol, your vegetable glycerin, and your flavorings. You don't necessarily, actually, one of the things that the FDA did in 2009 was you could not put flavorings into cigarettes anymore, except for menthol. I'll get into that. It's, yeah. But anyway, you couldn't put strawberry flavor, for example, into cigarettes. But there are in e-cigarettes. So those are really unique to e-cigarettes. So why do we care about those? So just in January now, a report came out on e-cigarette safety by the National Academy of Science. So basically what they did here is, I, I just heard the panel two weeks ago, uh, very well-renowned scientists. So they basically d divided it up into different sections, the epidemiology, the chemistry, the behavior, the clinical manifestations, and the public health implications. So they had experts on each one of those sort of categories, and they all sort of come, came together to write a report. And that was published just now in January of 2018. What they did here is they took all of the literature, including some of the research that we published, over 800 peer-reviewed articles, and basically combined them into and synthesized the information that came out of these articles and put them into this report or big review article. And basically what they came up with was a couple of different points, and this is, these are sort of like the cliff notes for this report. There's evidence that should suggest that while e-cigarettes are not without health risks, they are likely to be far less harmful than conventional cigarettes. That was one. 
Uh, they contain fewer numbers and lower levels of toxic substances than conventional cigarettes, and using e-cigarettes may help adults who smoke conventional cigarettes quit smoking. So e-cigarettes are now being really um, heavily investigated as a potential cessation tool. But what they also found was, so you can, you can look at e-cigarettes as a potential cessation tool uh, for people who have basically smoked a pack a day for 40 years, and they may have some significant benefits in that population. Having a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old at home, my concerns are a little different. And this was also addressed in this report. What they say among the youth, meaning teenagers in particular, high schoolers, middle schoolers, those who use e-cigarettes are at higher rates than adults do. <clears throat> There's substantial evidence that e-cigarettes actually provides a gateway drug. They're more likely to start smoking cigarettes. And they're also more likely to become addicted to nicotine, which is what was pointed out just earlier. So they do recognize that there is probably a very different and differential public health impact for e-cigarettes in, and I hate to say the older population because I belong to that now, the older population versus the sort of teenagers, middle schoolers, high schoolers. So just last night, as was pointed out in the introduction, there is now finally studies coming out indicating and providing real proof that there is significant toxicity and public health implications for adolescents using e-cigarettes. This was a study done by UCSF and was <coughs> excuse me, published in the Journal of Pediatrics. And what they basically found was that adolescents exposed to some of these flavors had more toxic, volatile organic chemicals, or VOCs, in their blood and in their urine and especially fruity flavors. So um, fruity flavors are very popular among adolescents, among the teenagers, such as strawberry or your kiwi, or I have like fruit loops there, and they come in all kinds of very attractive flavorings and, and bottles. They're very, very popular. They're the number one sort of group of flavors in that, gr in that sort of demographic. And what they found is the more, f the more of the fruity flavors these, these adolescents are using, the more they had these sort of toxic chemicals in their blood and in their urine. Some of these chemicals have been associated with the development of cancer. So what, what they didn't say is, does this imply when you now have a 14 or 16-year-old starting these e cigs over a lifetime exposure, are you now increasing their risk to cancer? That's obviously something that we don't know yet because they've only been here for about 10 years. So my big thing though with when we always compare the toxicity of cigarettes and e-cigarettes, that's always, we're always comparing the toxicity of e-cigarettes to something we know is really, really toxic. There's very few things that are more toxic than cigarettes. So we're comparing that to that all the time. My argument is are we actually comparing the right things to each other? Are we comparing apples and oranges here? If we're thinking about the co components that are being inhaled with e-cigarettes, they're going to be very different than the components inhaled by conventional tobacco cigarettes. So why do we think we can actually use the tobacco cigarettes as our benchmark for assessing toxicity and safety? From a toxicologist's perspective, that's what we do. So when we have a benchmark or we have like a reference to something, that's what we refer to with regards to safety. We call it either less safer or more safer. We call it it's like 95% safer or it's 50% less safe based on a benchmark reference um, article. And my argument is that cigarettes, to conventional tobacco cigarettes are not the correct reference. So our goal in my group is to look at what e-cigarettes do in the context of the respiratory immune system or the respiratory immune responses. When we think of immune responses, you probably think of like fighting bacteria and fighting viruses and things like that. And I'll show you all of this occurs in the lung and all of this is affected by e-cigarettes. But more importantly, one of the things that I always make 
the argument is when we look at immune responses, we're just, you know, going through a horrific flu season, a for horrific sort of virus infections, respiratory virus season in the wintertime. What you want your immune system to do is come in, take care of the pathogen, and then clear out, get back to the normal state. That's a beautiful homeostatic system. And that's sort of like the sweet spot that's in the middle there with a sort of light blue sort of coloring. You don't want too much immune response, and you don't want too little. If you're on either side of that very fine balance, you're getting into trouble. So you want to have it come in, do its job, get out. You don't want to have it linger too much, which is inflammation, and you don't want to have it too little, which is insufficient host response or immune suppression. So what we do is we sort of take a um, sort of um, multi-pronged approach to looking at immune defense mechanisms in the lung. There is a sort of continuous layer of um, cells, epithelial cells, that basically line your respiratory tract from the nose all the way down to the alveolar region, which is where your gas exchange occurs, the little bubbles at the end of your, uh, at the end of your airways. So there's this epithelium that's all the way down. You also have a number of sort of, I call them my guards that are always there. Uh, they're your resident immune cells that are always guarding your respiratory tract. They're there to basically take care of anything comes in. They're like the little Pac-Man, you know, they basically take care of anything that comes in and takes care of it right away. Either pollen or bacteria or viruses or particles or anything you inhale. They're there, ready to go. They don't need to come in. They're ready for action. Okay? So you have these cells in there all the time in your respiratory system. They're macrophages, they're neutrophils, and they're natural killer cells. And I'll get to that, those in a second. So what we did in our first study, we actually took um, uh, nasal epithelial cell biopsies. And I could actually do this right here. It's very non-invasive. Trust me, I do this all the time. So we get these superficial nasal scrapes from volunteers, and we got them from otherwise healthy, totally healthy, smokers, non-smokers, and current e-cig users. These were very healthy, very young. The average age was 28 years old. So they were not coughing, hacking up a lung COPD patients. Very healthy. I actually aged out of my own study, which is really depressing. So they were very young and healthy, um, and we analyzed them for um, genes or just the sort of markers of their immune status. You know, what, what do these cells look like? Have they, are they different from each other, and are they different from what a normal cell looks like in a normal, non-smoking, healthy individual? And this is what we got. In red are the smokers, in blue are your e-cig users. So we had 53 markers that were downregulated in both smokers and e-cig users, and 358 that were downregulated in e-cig users. So the e-cig users and the smokers, cigarette smokers, had similar results or similar modifications of their immune responses, but the e-cig users had a lot more, a lot more diversified in terms of what they do. So they do similar things what cigarette does, but they also do a lot more, at least based on our data. So one of the things that is of really great interest to me, in, in addition to, um, and it's certainly also based on some of the more recent studies coming out with these flavorings. And from a toxicologist perspective, these flavorings are really, really interesting, very active chemicals. We use them every day. We use them right now. We've had them with our dinner. We have them with our coffee. We have them all the time. These flavoring reagents are everywhere. We use vanilla. We use isomyl acetate, which is the major component that makes juicy fruits taste like juicy fruit gum. Menthol. We all have had lozenges with menthol or a mint. Cinnamon, cinnamaldehyde. We always love our cinnamon or cinnamon bun or cinnamon toast. So all of these are around us all the time. And so FEMA, which is the flavoring, which is the Extract Manufacturing Association, it's not the other FEMA, this FEMA, the flavoring FEMA, actually says that a lot of these are grass or generally regarded as safe. 
That's a toxicology term. Um, but they're doing this. They basically said that they're generally regarded as safe or grass because all the tests were done with oral consumption. So they're totally safe to eat. We eat them all the time. They're totally safe to eat. But are they safe to inhale? We don't know that. So if flavorings are, are safe to eat, they're probably safe to put on your skin. We probably use them in sort of consumer products all the time. Why are we worried? So one of the things that I teach my students in my introductory lecture in the toxicology course I teach at UNC is the basic principle of toxicology. The grandfather of toxicology is Paracelsus, who says basically all substances are poisons. There's none which is not a poison. The right dose differenti differentiates a poison from a remedy. Or the dose makes the poison. Water can be a poison. Oxygen can be a poison. Salt, sugar, they all can be poisons. It's all a matter of dose. My sort of you know, amendment to this is the route of exposure makes the poison. The example that I always give in, you know, to my students is you would never think about drinking a bottle of shampoo, but it's perfectly safe to use on your head and on your body and basically bathe in it. But you wouldn't think about drinking it. So why do we think that inhaling flavoring chemicals is safe? just because they're safe to eat. The, in, you know, the route of ingestion and then getting to the liver is super well equipped to detoxify anything. The liver is an amazing organ and it's sort of like the, the, you know, the superstar for toxicologists because it really is super well equipped to detoxify anything it can get its hands on. So when you think about the route of exposure and the effect or efficacy, there is basically several levels of detoxification. A lot of them occur in the liver. So you have phase one and phase two detoxification, which basically most of them are aimed to make something that is not water soluble, water soluble, so can be eliminated. That's the ultimate goal. And the liver and the kidney, is, they're, they're really, really well equipped to do that. The lung is not. And nobody explains this better than Steve Colbert, who had a, a sort of whole section on something called the vape shot. Does anybody, has everybody seen a vape shot? All right, this is the silliest device, but the episode is hilarious. So vape shot is a device that allows you to vaporize alcohol. So instead of drinking a couple of shots of vodka, you're basically just vaporizing it and inhaling it. What does that do? It bypasses the liver. Excellent. It bypasses the liver. So instead of basically having a stopgap and detoxifying alcohol, you basically don't. The other thing that going through your ingestion and through your liver does, there is sort of a couple stop mechanisms that we have when we drink too much. One is you pass out, or the second one is you vomit. Well, and what Steve Colbert says is, you know, when you vape your alcohol, it's fascinating because lungs don't vomit. So his episode really brings it home, like why the route of exposure matters. And I'm still waiting to actually use this in one of our toxicology questions in our exams, but I have not been able to do that yet, so it'll come. Um, so one of the most um, sort of popularized examples of why the route of exposure matters with regards to flavorings is called diacetyl. Does anybody know what diacetyl is? Popcorn. Popcorn lung. That's exactly right. So diacetyl is a buttery flavor. It's actually contained in butter. Diacetyl is in butter. We take it and we probably ingest it every day. It's in coffee creamers, it's in coffee itself, popcorn, anything that has a buttery taste probably has diacetyl in it. Perfectly safe to eat, perfectly safe to eat. I love butter, love popcorn, so perfectly safe to eat. However, if you inhale it too much, you basically develop exactly what the gentleman over here said. You develop a disease called popcorn lung. What is that? 
So in the late 1990s, early 2000s, workers in a popcorn factory came down with a disease called bronchiolitis obliterans. That's usually a disease you only see in people who are rejecting a lung transplant. It's a non-reversible disease which causes sort of stiffening of the lung, wheezing, fibrosis, and it's now called, it's actually now a diagnosed disease called popcorn lung. These people did not necessarily smoke, but they developed a disease that they should not have. And it was traced back to their occupational exposure to diacetyl, to this buttery flavor. So again, you're not going to develop popcorn lung by eating popcorn. You're only going to develop popcorn lung by inhaling it. So the route of exposure really matters. Yes? You can smell butter. That's right. So you can so so you can smell a lot of things, and you can smell a lot of the things that mess with your lungs. Absolutely correct. I refer you back to the dose makes the poison. So I still love smelling butter. The, the, the smell of butter is awesome, but not at the levels that occurred in this factory. So if you think about the levels you're probably going to be inhaling with an e-liquid that is basically pure butter, you're getting to those levels. So what we looked at is cinnamon or cinnamaldehyde. I love cinnamon. It's in everything. It's like in, you know, in, in rice pudding. I love putting cinnamon on my yogurt, cinnamon bun, big red. It's in all kinds of different products. It's a, it's a great flavoring agent. But it's also available, you know, instead of eating your cinnamon, you can also vape cinnamon or cinnamaldehyde. And it comes in very different, many different sort of varieties. One down here, which we just got in our lab, is called napalm. Who thought it would be a good idea to vape something that's called napalm? That's beyond me. I know. I got two of them, so yeah. So um, there's actually several studies that have shown that cinnamaldehyde causes toxicity in a variety of different models, in variety of different in vitro models as well as animal models. So we wanted to also look at cinnamon and cinnamaldehyde and cinnamon, cinnamon flavored e-liquids with regards to the toxicity on some of the innate immune defense mechanisms that I've already introduced to you, but more specifically now to these particular sort of guards that are patrolling the lungs at all times, making sure we're not overcome with a bacterial or viral infection. Macrophages, neutrophils, and natural killer cells. What we did is we basically exposed them to cinnamon-flavored e-liquids, purchased them at our local vape shop, um, and basically then looked at changes in cellular function. So what we focused on was changes in the function that they should normally um, fulfill. So this is sort of engulfing bacteria for neutrophils and macrophages, which is what their job is. Or in the case of natural killer cells, they're there to either kill tumor cells or virus-infected cells. So we basically looked at does their function change? So for macrophages, what we saw was it completely abolished their ability to ingest bacteria. We saw the same thing for neutrophils. And for natural killer cells, we saw a complete abolition of their ability to, to basically attack and kill a tumor cell or a virus-infected cell. So their function was completely abolished by one of the cinnamon-flavored e-liquids that we bought from a local shop. And we also found it in a dose-dependent manner with cinnamaldehyde alone. So we actually established a cause and effect relationship. So to finish up, where do we go from here? One of the things and one of the reasons why I love these kinds of venues and because I want to get the information out there, I do think e-cigarettes probably have a place in our society. But I want to get away from the thought that they may be just like you know, milder cigarettes. I think they're different, and we need to treat them as, as that. We need to identify toxicities associated with that, and we need to regulate them as that. They're different. We should not necessarily take cigarettes as the benchmark. We also want to understand, are there any sort of adverse health effects that are unique to e-cigarettes, like the popcorn lung? Are there any things that, any sort of diseases that are now popping up? There's a lot of studies now also looking, for example, at the oral mucosa. Do some of these flavors potentially cause gum disease or changes in the oral and, and dental world? Are there other effects that are unique to e-cigarettes that we wouldn't see 
with conventional tobacco products. And of course, I really want to understand these flavors. If we can identify individual flavors that we can regulate and take off the market, maybe we have a chance to make this a safer product. Like cinnamaldehyde should not be in there anymore. It's, a, it's an easy one. We know what it does. So take it out. And as a matter of fact, which is really interesting, some of the tobacco companies are already ahead of us. They have a lot more data than we can ever generate. They're not using cinnamaldehyde in, in a lot of their flavors anymore because they know it's toxic and they don't want to basically be subjective to a potential lawsuit. So they know it. So really, again, so what informs regulation is to really establish a cause and effect relationship. We're on our way to doing that with some of the sort of controlled exposures we're doing, some of the more controlled human studies and cl clinical trials we're doing. So we really want to understand is there a difference between specific flavors that we can you know, basically go back to the regulatory agencies and say, listen, this is probably something that should be regulated and should be taken out of these products. So with that, I need to acknowledge some of the people, or basically all of the people who did this work, because, you know, I, just, I don't go back into the lab. My students are terrified when I put on a lab coat. Uh, some of the folks in the Center for Environmental Medicine, Asthma, and Lung Biology, it was CMELP. Uh, Terry Noah is a pediatric pulmonologist and my partner in crime in a lot of these clinical studies here. Um, the curriculum in toxicology, which I direct and uh, provides me with a fantastic group of students and postdocs bringing high energy, uh, lots of really, really good science to the lab. Uh, School of Public Health, Dr. Rebecca Fry is a really close collaborator of mine and the uh, UNC Cystic Fibrosis Center, Rob Tarrant, who is the uh, PI of the grant that basically paid for a lot of these things, as well as Neil Benowitz uh, from UCSF, who is one of the authors on the study that was just published uh, last night in pediatrics, chemistry, and my funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. All right, we've got a few minutes. Let's get started. I was wondering if there are any studies on if there's any secondhand smoke effect on the rest of us. Oh, excellent question. So, yes. Um, I'm, as a matter of fact, I um, just submitted a lot of reviews today. I'm on an NIH review panel looking at exactly that. I want to do one of those studies because I absolutely agree with you. We don't know what's coming out once people exhale it. So the studies are ongoing. Um, originally, it was not a big deal because when you leave e-cigs alone, they don't do what cigarettes do. They don't have the sight stream smoke. Um, but we're realizing now that there's probably a secondhand exposure. One, t one thing I can tell you wh why it's probably really, really relevant, uh, when you go into a vape shop, they have to wipe the surfaces every day because they have a huge amount of residue basically landing on the surfaces. So if it lands on surfaces, you know it's going to be somewhere else. So excellent question. Yes. Uh, I had three questions. Um, <laughs> That's okay. One of them is, are there any toxic effects just from nicotine? Because I've never really heard anybody pin that one down. <laughs> yeah. The second one is, what is the effect of propylene glycol on your lungs, cause, which is basically drinkable antifreeze? And the third one was, um, which my son had asked me, was uh, I think there's some member of the acetyl family that's in um, vanilla. And is in, are they, have you done any tests on that? So let me address the last one first. So you, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're talking about ethyl vanillin or benzaldehyde. So there's, there's definitely one of the reasons why I like these flavors because of their chemistry. They have some really, really interesting chemistry. Um, and some of these sort of flavors that you probably are referring to is exactly that. Second one, let me go backwards. Second one was the propylene glycol. Very interesting question. So does propylene glycol cause toxicity by itself? One thing that's really interesting is that when you vaporize propylene glycol, especially with the newer devices, you actually cause sort of um, thermal degradation of it because you, you're heating these up. You're heating up the coils up to like almost 300, 400 degrees. So in addition to having propylene glycol, which still is going to be in your aerosol, you're also generating things like acrolein, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, crotonalide, which we know are bad. 
So, so propylene glycol by itself probably has potentially some toxicity, but I'm actually more concerned about the reaction products of propylene glycol that are produced once you heat it up in the e -cig. The first one was, the question was nicotine. Interesting question. Um, there's lots of research being done on nicotine, and the big push by FDA is now actually generating or approving or publicizing these um, sort of low nicotine products, these sort of basically products that have just enough nicotine but not causing addiction. So the lung has lots of nicotinic receptors, um, and it probably can respond to it. Does nicotine alone in the lung cause toxicity? I'm not so sure. However, it does cause known toxicity in the brain, certainly cardiovascular, lots and lots of cardiovascular effects. And what's really interesting is, so some smoking pregnant mothers are advised to use e-cigarettes, and the e-cigarettes still have nicotine. In utero, nicotine exposure has known effects on the offsprings. So in a roundabout way, what I'm telling you is nicotine does have effects which probably are organ specific. Again, I'm not so sure about the lung, but I do know certainly in the cardiovascular brain and offsprings in the developmental you know, of fetus. Um, I'm still a little confused about the difference between vapors and aerosols. Can you oh, define that? Oh, yes. So this goes back to my sort of um, ambient air pollution aerosol roots. Um, and um, I have to go back to some of my colleagues who are way smarter about this than I am. So an aerosol is the particle. A vapor, vapor is basically a liquid that's now in the gas phase. That is a vapor. So when you have an aerosol, that implies that you have a particle and a gas phase in an equilibrium. So you have gas phase components as well as particle components. So an e-cigarette is not a vapor, it is a particle, it's an aerosol. That is a misconception. It's not water vapor, which we all know when we boil water, that's the vapor. That's basically going from a... What he's breathing is an, is an aerosol because you have particles in there. So the aerosol implies that there's particles. Vapor is basically the gas phase state of a liquid. Does that make sense? But you definitely have particles, which makes it an aerosol. That's a misconception, though, because vapor seems sort of safe. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, you argue quite convincingly that um, in research, um, e-cigarettes should not be compared with regular cigarettes. Mm -hmm. What should they be compared oh, good with? Question. Yeah, I don't know. Research? I really don't know what they should be compared to. And should we compare them, or should we just sort of look at them as they are? Um, I, it's a very good question. I don't know. I just don't think cigarettes are the right um, reference, which is, you know, we all do it because we sort of have to in order to get things published in the peer review, you know, literature. But I'm not sure it, it should be because they're different. Yeah, I don't know. Yes? What's the relative amount of money spent on conventional cigarettes versus e-cigs? Ooh, I don't know. I don't know what uh, cigarette sales are these days. I think they're, they're certainly down. Uh, smoking rate is, is um, significantly reduced, um, certain, instead of, ex except for certain demographics. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know what the current sort of money, um, the, the, you know, the money is being made in conventional cigarettes. I need to look that up. That's a great question. Um, I just was going to um, speak on, I, I, about two years ago, I smoked for probably 25 years. And um, I worked at a hair salon, and they told me, try this vape, and you'll quit smoking. So I started out with the little one and all that, and then I, I graduated, as they say, in vape shops. And I smoked this other one, it had batteries, and blah, blah, blah. So then I did quit smoking cigarettes, but I started like at 28 milligrams. Excellent. And now I'm down to three, but yeah. I'm highly addicted to the e -cig. Like I have one with me, and um, so I guess my question is, you know, and I smoke a flavor mm -hmm. well, so I guess I just didn't really get from you, like is it 
safe? Is it not? Well, or stay away from cinnamon. So that's all I can tell you. Well, okay. uh, stay away from any sort of you know cinnamon flavors. So this is this is a really interesting point. I'm glad you're bringing this up. This is now the public health debate. How long did you smoke? I smoked for 25, almost 30 years. Did you smoke about half a pack a day or something? At least a half a pack or a pack. Yeah. So this is exactly the public health debate. So is it safer for someone like you to switch to e-cigarettes and get away from cigarettes and possibly you know, reverse some of, the, you know, some of the adverse health effects that you've caused by smoking cigarettes? And I think the answer is yes. So for someone like you, switching to, ci to e-cigarettes, avoiding cinnamon flavors, <laughs> um, is, is probably of public health benefit. And that's, I think, where the debate is. That's why I keep saying, I think they have a place in our society exactly for people like you. But at the same time, also, I don't want them to be advertised as Fruit Loops, which are very attractive to my 14-year-old daughter. So that's where the public health debate is. So what I want to do as a toxicologist is make sure that we make a safe product and inform the regulatory agencies to say, don't use these flavors, don't make devices that go up to 300 degrees Celsius, so basically you're burning the propylene glycol. So make it into a product that can be marketed accordingly and be safe. That's what I want to do. I don't, I, th I don't think they're going to go away because I think they have a purpose exact, exactly like what you're saying. You have reduced to three mg per mil of nicotine, so you've, you basically are reducing your nicotine addiction. But, you know, maybe that's, what, that's where the public health debate is. And I agree. I'm not demonizing e-cigarettes. I think they do have a place in our society. Right. I just want to make them safe. <laughs> okay. And I was just going to say something. Somebody asked about spending money on it. But, you know, once you, I mean, everybody said, oh, it's much cheaper to buy juice. But when you go into a vape shop, they want you to buy a new device and oh, this yeah. and that. Oh, yeah. So, the marketing is amazing. The market is amazing. So. The marketing is amazing. It is. It's really amazing. I didn't even show you some of the newer devices that are out there now where you can actually have vaporware. So they now have devices where it's actually like a, almost like a camelback, like a, like a backpack, where you have your hose, you have your e-stick device here, and then you have your hose around, and it's basically, basically like a camelback, so you can take it everywhere. Um, it's unbelievable, you know, the, the creativity is just endless here. So it's, it's fascinating. Um, so it's, it's everywhere. Yes? So um, kind of picking up from that, I'm um, fascinated by the, the sociology and the, the psychology ah. of these things and, you know, making them healthy in society and acceptable, as, as you mm -hmm. said, giving them a role. I mean, it's probably a reasonable assumption that one of the reasons that teens and 20s prefer these things is precisely because people my age don't. And yeah. other things <laughs> that we can do to, you, know, you talked about fruit flavors in particular being so dangerous. Campaigns that we can do, for example, to persuade teens and 20-somethings that fruit flavors are for little kids and that they should be smoking. So making, making them look not cool? Yeah. It's like it's so for a five-year-old. You know, yeah, yeah, just make the safer things seem the cooler things. Right. Seems like a, you know, it seems like a more successful strategy than um, the anti-smoking campaigns that I've seen for, you know, like the last 40 years of my life where you tell people how dangerous cigarettes are. Right how unpleasant they are, and everybody goes, cool, I'm a bad guy. Right, right. <laughs> and it's actually, what is amazing is, when you look at the advertisement, um, so there's, uh, at, at Stanford, they actually made a comparison of what kind of strategies were used for uh, commercials and advertisement of cigarettes in the 50s and the 60s and 70s and 80s. And the e cig companies basically just copied them and made them current. It's the exact same strategies. You know, the sort of sex appeal, the cool guy, you know, the cutesy, like pink, you know, bubble gum is all of those kinds of, you know, at, attracting certain demographics are now being used by e-cigarettes. So the, the, the caution, that the, the worry that I have is um, I think in the United States we've done a good job in reducing the smoking rate because we've informed the public. We really had many campaigns with tobacco-free kids, the one that you mentioned, absolutely. So I think we've done a really good job in sort of, you know, reducing the smoking rate, which is really relatively low in the U.S. It's under 20% now. 
But what I'm worried about is with these e-cigs. So if my 14-year-old or 16-year-old is now getting interested in e-cigs, they're getting addicted to nicotine. And that's, that's, that's a behavior, that's a physiological response. They're addicted to nicotine. I don't want a new generation of nicotine addiction to grow up here. So that's, that's where my worry is. Let's give her one more round of applause and say thank you. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight to the Science Cafe. I hope you learned something about what's going on in the world around you tonight. I'll let you know about next week, next Thursday night, the 15th, is Brain Awareness Night. So you want to come early because out here on the first floor of the museum, we're going to have lots of tables set up where you can see brains, learn about brains. There are going to be shorter talks happening in the Daily Planet Theater, so you can get little tidbits of brain science. And then we'll have a special guest speaker doing the official Science Cafe starting at 7 o'clock. And then I think you'll be able to go back out and interact with the exhibits again. So get here super early. That's 5 to 8, or 5 to a little after 8. Thereabouts. Brain Awareness Night. Don't miss it next week at the Science Cafe. Good night, everybody. Travel safe. We'll see you soon.